All right, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you uh, for the organizers for inviting uh, this paper to a conference. Uh, my name is Olga Timoshenko, and this paper is co-authored with Eric Sager at the Federal Reserve Board. And I want to talk today about uncertainty and trade elasticities. So Maxim's paper we just saw uh, applied the idea of uncertainty towards in the context of public taxation. This paper applies it in the context of trade. And so begin, I'd like to start with a few definitions. So first, what am I going to mean by uncertainty? So in this case, I refer to a firm's idiosyncratic information about the firm's supply or demand side shocks. So in my previous work, I focused on demand uncertainty of firms facing demand uncertainty in foreign markets. So when I think about uncertainty, I think about firms being uncertain about demand conditions that they face in foreign markets. So to give you an example of bad or good demand shock realizations, let's take two US multinationals, so Barbie dolls, Marvel, and Coca-Cola. Both of these companies are high productive firms. They have very high sales in the US market. And so suppose these two companies want to enter the Chinese market. So probably their demand expectations are similar in the case that they expect the demand both of their products will be high in the foreign market. The realization of demand shocks between these two markets was different. So Coca-Cola became successful in the Asian market, while Barbie dolls were not. And so in this case, the demand for the, the, the expectation about how women should look like and the doll representing these values was inconsistent because between American and Asian values. So that's what I think about uncertainty. That's something that firms can learn about demand in foreign markets that is exogenous to them, that, de that will determine their profitability in the market thereafter and will determine their either success or exit. And so how does that apply to trade? So when I'm going to think about trade elasticity, I'm thinking about how trade flows change with respect to variable trade costs. So for example, an example of trade cost uh, uh, is, uh, could be a, a paper by my discussant Arvik that looks at the removal of GSP tariffs that Belarusian firms face in the European Union. So that's movement away from free trade. And what my paper is try, will try to argue is that the way firms and exporters will adjust to the removal of tariffs will depend on the extent of information uncertainty they face in foreign market. So potentially, this difference in the way firms respond across industries could have information about what demand uncertainty they face in foreign markets. And so to link these two ideas together, that's exactly what the question this paper asks is that, what's the effect of uncertainty on trade elasticities? So what are the ways in which firms adjust to changes in variable trade costs when they face the demand uncertainty? Okay, and in doing that, I'm going to relate to this idea of um, what welfare implications that has. So Arkolakis, Costino, Rodriguez, Clea have demonstrated that welfare gains from trade are directly linked to measurement of trade elasticity. And so in, in this famous ACR equation, the higher is the trade elasticity, the lower the welfare gains from trade. But if trade elasticity is endogenous to the information environment, that means that the welfare gains from trade also depend on whether firms live in complete or incomplete information or the extent of variation, uh, the extent of volatility of demand or information that firms have. And uh, what has been shown in the literature, again, and, and Maxim talked about it in the context of macro literature as well, that most of the research in trade also focuses on implications of models with complete information. So Arkulakis, Costino, Rodriguez, Clea developed this welfare results in the context of complete information. We have estimates of trade elasticities based on gravity equations that also use assumptions of complete information. The literature, however, have moved a little bit further in thinking about firm dynamics and including my, my work uh, myself, have shown that models with incomplete information match firm level dynamics better. And so in this case, I looked at the growth rate of exporters in foreign markets, the way they set prices of inputs and outputs in foreign markets, how that evolves over time, how their product choice evolves over time, and models where firms face demand uncertainty match better those uh, time series observations about firms over their life cycle. And however, this, again, implications of models with uncertainty uh, for, for welfare, for measurements of trade elasticity have not been well explored, and that's exactly what we do in this paper. So to approach this question, we are going to do it in, in the following steps. So first, we'll take an economic environment 
that encompasses complete and incomplete information. So we think about firms having two shocks, productivity and demand shocks. And so what we assume about firms' knowledge of either productivity and the demand shocks will embed uh, either one of the frameworks. And in particular, when we're going to be thinking about uncertainty, that's an environment where firms absorb productivity, but they do not absorb demand. So like uh, both Barbie and Coca-Cola, they knew their productivity, but they didn't necessarily know the demand in the foreign market. As opposed to models with complete information, where firms observe both productivity and demand. So probably when Belarusian firms want to export into nearby markets like Poland and Ukraine, the preferences are quite similar, and so they are more certain about their demand conditions there. In this model, in this environment, we are going to think about trade elasticities and welfare, and what we are going to demonstrate is that under uncertainty, trade is more elastic. But what I have shown you is elasticity is inversely related to welfare. And as a result, the welfare gains from trade are lower. So in fact, when, yeah? Why can't firms just learn demand? Like there is market research on focus groups like with Barbie. Couldn't they just know, learn before going to China that the Chinese will buy gold? Like there is a cost of learning. And not all firms can absorb that cost. So only the most productive firms or, or the most productive firms can absorb the cost and have some uh, idea of the, of the market conditions. But the low productivity firms wouldn't be able to absorb that sum of cost. So then tell about should like, rather than think about smaller firms? And again, firms are heterogeneous in terms of productivity and they will be impacted differently based on their productivity as well. Yeah, and so uh, with that, uh, with that theoretical understanding, we are going to think about strategies for estimating trade elasticities. And what our theoretical framework will tell us is that different the data, depending on what we think about the information structure, data means different things. So in particular, uh, in the world of uncertainty, we want to measure trade elasticity. We want to look at the data that encompasses information that firms know. And it turns out that in this case, it's going to be data on export quantities. What, what do you mean by under uncertainty, trade is more elastic? So the measure, so, so you estimate elasticities by making some assumptions in a model. So in a model where you estimate trade elasticities, assuming that there is uncertainty, you get estimates of trade elasticities that are larger. So the elasticity of the quantity of goods flowed with respect to tariffs? Is that the elasticity of trade flows with respect to variable trade costs. So how much total trade changes when variable trade costs either increase or decrease. So is the right way to, just to try to get the intuition done, is the right way to think about this paper is saying that suppose that firms are a little bit risk averse mm -hmm. and there's some uncertainty as to trade with foreign markets, I can sort of think about it that is like having an extra fixed cost into entering the market. Mm -hmm. And as soon as you bring down other costs, I'm going to overcome that fixed cost and then things are really elastic. Right. So you're, you're comparing sort of two steady states, one in which firms make decisions knowing their demand shocks, and one where they make it not knowing the demand shocks, right? right. And so if firms live in the world of uncertainty, which they probably do, the measurements of trade elasticity are biased when you use complete information framework to estimate them. Just to put this in my book. My words one more time, though, but what you're basically saying is something that we may have identified as an iceberg cost before, we're going to identify now as a fixed cost. Right? That can impact those estimations too, right? Because under answer, what you attribute would, to the fixed cost under complete information could be, be the result of uncertainty. Yeah. Oh, let me rephrase this cost for me. Trade is more elastic than we thought, or trade is more elastic in one model versus another model? The second one. So if we estimate trade elasticity using complete information, those estimates are biased. If firms live uh, in uh, incomplete information world, and those estimates are biased down. So trade is more elastic under uncertainty as compared to complete information. It would just depend on how we identify the fixed cost of trade. Exactly. Right? So if you identify the fixed cost of trade as being some empirical thing, saying this is the tariffs um, that are involved, so tariffs okay. is a variable cost. So fixed cost could be this uh, sunk upfront cost, for example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so sorry, what you're what you're saying is that we should think about uncertainty as being part of a fixed cost. Okay. Right? 
that I so need really, to go out and find out what is the market demand for my good. So in, in a dynamic framework, firms will gradually learn yeah. about about the their demand shock. So it's a concurrent cost involved every period to learn about demand. Okay, and so what we see is that in that case, then, we need data that encompasses the correct information to identify trade elasticities. And in a model with uncertainty, that is quantity and not sales. And the reason it's not sales, because sales encompass any realization of shocks that occurred in the foreign market. Could be aggregate shocks, idiosyncratic shocks, demand shocks, anything is embedded in sales that's not necessarily related to the information that firms know when they make the decision to enter or how much to sell to that market. But the models of complete information, that's irrelevant. So since firms know uh, everything, could be quantity of sales data. So usually that sales data that identifies trade elasticities, and that's where the implications for gravity equations come from in the world of complete information using sales data. So what we are going to do then now with that insight, we are going to think about so quantifying. Can, can, can you explain one more time what, so why is it that the quantity data identifies elasticities? So when, I'm assuming I should read when it says uncertainty, I can just read incomplete information. Correct. Yes. Okay. So what, what is it about incomplete information? So the best way to think about it is that sales, firms never choose sales. They either they can choose to enter or exit. They can choose prices, they can choose quantities, they can choose partners, but the, the, the sales is an endogenous outcome of the choices. And so under uncertainty... Wait, so sales is not prices times quantity? It's Something price else? times quantities, but firms choose one variable, either price or quantities. Oh. So in this framework, if firms choose quantities, price clears the market and embeds all realization of shocks of which firms were uncertain about. Okay. And you just Yes. And we redo our exercise with firm choosing prices, and the result is the same again because of what you said price times quantity of sales. Okay, and so with that framework, then uh, we want to quantify the effect of uncertainty. So, speaking, how, how much is the bias by assuming complete information? And in this context, we are going to use Brazilian export data. And what we are going to find is that on average, Elasticities are 7% larger when they are estimated in the world with complete information relative to when they're estimated by assuming uh, complete information. Can I, can I read from this? They're 7% larger if I use sorry, if I use quantities as opposed Correct. to using sales. Exactly. Exactly. That's exactly what that means. And then this gap or this bias increases with the extent of uncertainty. So the larger, and, and we'll have a measure of demand variation, so the larger is the demand variation, the larger is this bias in, in computing elasticities under assumption of complete versus incomplete information. Okay, and then uh, again, uh, given that elasticities are directly related to measurements of welfare, we conduct the counterfactual exercise and we find is that the welfare gains are overstated by 1 to 12%, uh, in the world with complete information. So in fact, when firms face uncertainty, the welfare gains from trade are going to be lower, and that, that, that extent, again, depends on the extent of uncertainty firms face in foreign markets. So that's the general outline of the paper. Now let me get uh, into details of how we arrived to these results. And so for the economic environment, we take um, a standard monopolistic competition framework uh, where firms uh, compete in a monopolistic competition world, so each firm supplies one variety. Uh, we assume uh, CES uh, preferences, uh, we assume exogenous entry, and uh, again, given that quantity is going to be playing an important role, we write our model as, as having n countries and k sectors. So each sector will have their, um, there's k sectors. Okay, and so in this framework, we have two types of shocks. So first, on the demand side, from space demand shock theta, that's drawn from a distribution, G of theta. So those distributions will become relevant when we start talking about estimation, so let's keep them in mind. And on the supply side, firms draw their productivity shock, uh, phi, that's the standard Melis productivity shock in, in, the stand, in the monopolistic competition trade models, and that's drawn from a different distribution, phi, and it's important to know that the distribution of demand, the demand and productivity shocks are independent from each other. 
Okay, so what does information mean in this case? So under uncertainty, firms always observe their productivity and any decisions they make will depend on their productivity. So that's a decision to enter or exit or how much to sell in the market. And they make those decisions based on some expectation about demand. So in this framework, we, have to, uh, we will assume that all firms have share the same expectations uh, and we can extend that result further, but our results don't depend on that. And under complete information, firms observe both their productivity and demand shocks before they start to export into a market. And what will turn out to be is that we're going to define the profitability uh, parameter of the firm. That is a linear combination of demand and productivity shocks. And under complete information is the profitability that will determine how, how firms export and uh, in what quantities and whether they export or not. Okay, and what's important to note for our results uh, later on is that notice that profitability, which determines decisions under complete information, is a mean preserving spread of productivity, which determines decisions under incomplete information. And so that will drive our theoretical results and what will uh, allow us to sign uh, elasticity symbol. Okay, but to move forward, let me now talk about trade elasticity. So in this framework, the partial elasticity of trade flows with respect to variable trade costs takes this general form. So on average, trade elasticity is determined by the partial elasticity, partial, the, the epsilon k, the elasticity of substitution across varieties. So if the varieties are more substitutable, trade is more elastic. But then it's decomposed into intensive and extensive margin. So the extensive margin is the trade flows that are generated by entrants and exitors, while the intensive margin is the trade flows that are generated by incumbent firms. And so in the simple case of Krugman framework, where there's no selection, all firms have the same productivity, the extensive margin is zero, so there's no entry and exit, all firms either export or they don't. And so in this case, the partial elasticity of trade flows is just 1 minus epsilon, just determined by the elasticity of substitution across varieties. The next uh, reference point is Chanet model that assumes that productivity is drawn from a Pareto distribution. That simplifies this expression a lot. So in this case, uh, the partial trade elasticity is just given by the tail parameter of the Pareto distribution. So that's exogenous, doesn't depend on preferences, just depend, depends on parameters of productivity distribution. In the more general form, extensive margin takes uh, the following form. So it depends on two crucial uh, per, uh, uh, variables. One is the entry threshold, so x star. So the entry threshold with respect to the correct variable, which, which I define in a moment. So it's going to be the productivity or profitability. It depends on the distribution of that underlying heterogeneity. Yeah, and if uh, with some uh, algebraic manipulation, that becomes the hazard ratio. So uh, extensive margin is a hazard ratio associated with a distribution that is determined by the distribution of underlying heterogeneity and the threshold. Okay, and so what this equation, uh, the, the trade elasticity takes the same form uh, regardless of the information, but it's the, what x star and g of x mean, uh, that depends on the information environment. So in particular, what goes into these two variables under uncertainty is the productivity. So the relevant variable that determines heterogeneity, that determines entry and exit, is the scale productivity and its distribution. <coughs> and under complete information, the relevant heterogeneity is determined by profitability shock and the corresponding distribution of profitability. And so now if we stare at this table for a little bit, we notice that it will help us to think about how to compare or sign elasticities between information environments and how to identify them. So in particular, if you want to compare trade elasticities, notice that the elasticity uh, is, a, is a hazard rate. And from the IO literature, we know that hazard rates, uh, I mean, a hazard rate of a mean preserving spread is lower. And so under some conditions here, uh, the complete information elasticity is smaller than under uncertainty because productivity is a mean preserving spread of uh, profitability is a mean preserving spread of productivity. Okay, so that simplifies this particular result. And what that implies for welfare is that notice that in this case, I extend uh, this is an extension of the ACR equation to the multi industry setup. 
And again, the welfare is inversely related to trade elasticity. And so if under complete information, the extensive margin is lower, the overall trade elasticity is lower, and therefore the welfare gains from trade would be higher under complete information. So part of the adjustment will be determined by how firms, the, the size of the entrants and exiters, depending on the information environment. But notice that it also has implications for the total trade flows. And total trade flows are also inversely related to the extensive margin of trade elasticity. And now what that means is that under, under complete information, the, the volume of trade flows is larger compared to uncertainty. So as a result, the domestic trade share, pi, the share of expenses on domestic goods is lower. And again, that impacts elasticity. So there are two channels that will impact welfare. One of them is the entry and exit channel. And the other one is the size of the incumbent firms. So we'll try to pin down the magnitudes of these channels in our quantitative exercise. And before we get there, I need to tell how, how we estimate trade elasticities. So a particular, let's stare at this um, table one more time and notice that let's look at the quantity. And so the expression for quantity, which is the choice variable of the firms in this environment, under uncertainty, that's exactly uh, given by the productivity. So if I want to back out the distribution of productivity to estimate the trade elasticity, quantity distribution exactly gives me the, the necessary productivity distribution. But that's not true under complete information. Under complete information, the relevant rel variable is profitability, and that's contained exactly in the sales. And so here, if we think about what sales mean under uncertainty, that's what I was telling in the introduction, that sales encompass something that firms know, productivity, but also something that they don't know, the demand shock. And so that's why the estimates of trade elasticity using sales data would be biased if, in fact, firms live in a world with uncertainty. Okay, so what we are going to do is that that's the exactly we'll proceed with our identification is that we will use quantity data under assumption of uncertainty to pin down the distribution of productivity and the productivity entry shock, to productivity entry threshold to back out the elasticities under uncertainty. And we'll use the sales data to back out the distribution of profitability and profitability entry threshold to get an estimate of trade elasticity under complete information. Okay, and so to proceed, let me first describe the data that we'll use to conduct that exercise. So the data will come from Brazilian customs declaration records that keep track of export value, export quantity at the firm product destination year level. And so in this case, uh, let, let us note by that by observation, we will mean distribution. So an observation is the distribution of log export sales uh, of firms, of Brazilian exporters in a given destination, in a given year, in a given industry. And so with that, we have 190 observations, or 190 distributions at the destination year industry level, and we'll use those distributions to estimate elasticities. So to give you an example of how they differ, here is a representative <coughs> observation. On the right side, I plot the distribution of log sales. On the left side, I put the, plot the distribution of log quantity. And let me point out some moments. So notice that the variance or standard deviation of sales is almost twice as large as quantity. So what does that mean? That there is some realization of shock in between uh, under the model of uncertainty that makes the, dis the distribution of sales more preserved. And so we'll use this difference in the variance of quantity and sales to pin down the variance of the demand shock that each industry will face. And notice that another useful measure to look at is the Caddy skewness measure. So a skewed distribution, a positively skewed distribution, have a large weight in the right tail. So there's a lot of mass or there's large amount of large firms. And so notice that, again, the log quantity data is positively skewed, while log sales data is negatively skewed, which means that many firms sell large quantity, but, they, but their realized sales are small. Okay, and so the reason why that could be the case is that even though the quantity is large, when the demand shock is very bad, the realized sales will be low. So the price will absorb the demand shock uh, so as that 
realized sales will be low in the event of a bad shock. So that's exactly the contrast that we keep in mind when we think about the role of uncertainty in trade data, that it, it, we can see that by comparing the distributions of quantity and sales. Okay, so what we are going to do is we will use that distributions to pin down uh, trade elasticities. So the way we'll do that, we'll log linearize expression for quantity. And notice that in log linear form, log quantity is a, is a constant. So this is a, a origin destination industry fixed effect that's common across firms. So it doesn't affect the shape of the distribution. And we are not concerned about the mean of the distribution for elasticity estimate. But we want to know its shape, and the shape of log quantity gives us the shape of productivity. And so with some caveats, we fit the distribution. And what we are going to do is we, we will fit first through 99 percentile of the distribution. So in particular, we fit the, both the left and the right tail of distribution. And we, uh, we, we uh, take moments uh, of the distribution to match the sum of squared deviations of percentile. The distribution that we need to parameterize the distribution, typically uh, literature makes assumption of either Pareto or log normal. What we have shown and what I have shown in my previous work is that the generalization of both of these distributions, the double EMG distribution, which is the sum of independent normal and double Pareto, matches the data better. So it can have fatness in both right and left tails, which is crucial given the graph I just shown. And so we feed double EMG distribution to the data and use that to pin down trade elasticity. So, and subsequently we need to recover the entry threshold and we are going to recover the entry threshold by matching average to minimum ratio of export quantities to sales. And so how large is the smallest firm compared to an average firm contains information about the entry threshold. And so we'll pin it down in that way. So finally, we take the um, elasticity of substitution across varieties from Soda Berry's work. Again, we follow the same steps to estimate our, our elasticities under complete information, but we apply these steps to the log export sales data. Okay, and so with that method, here's the result, the first result. So let me highlight the red number here. So 1.07 means 7%. And so that's the amplification effect that is obtained by dividing the quantity-based measure of trade elasticity by the sales-based measure. So it measures how much quantity elasticities are larger compared to the sales-based elasticities. And as the number I quoted in the beginning of the talk, that on average, trade is more elastic on the uncertainty, and that magnitude is about 7% larger. Again, okay, what is important is that that depends on the measure of uncertainty. So what we can plot is this amplification effect as a measure of demand uncertainty. And as I mentioned before, we measure demand uncertainty by differences in the variance of our quantities and sales. And so in the environments where demand uncertainty is larger, or the distribution of sales, are, the, the, the difference in variances is larger be, between quantity and sales data, the amplification effect is larger. So in fact, the complete information elasticities are even more biased when the environment is very uncertain. Okay, and so what we are going to do with that next is that what we want to know is that what that implies for the measurements of welfare, so how much we under or overestimate welfare gains from trade. And what we are doing is we'll calibrate this model or calibrate a model with under uncertainty uh, matching exactly the moments I just described. We'll make, make the model match the estimated trade elasticity, the variance of quantity and sales data, and the average value of quantity and sales. So we take the model with uncertainty to match everything we can observe about the distribution of quantities and sales. That will parameterize the model. And next, we are going to keep all structural parameters constant, and the only change that we'll do is change the information structure. So we are going to make firms have complete information holding parameters uh, constant. That will tell us how much, what is the role of information in, in measurements of welfare while the structural parameters are the same. Okay, and so here's what we find. So first we look at the overall measure of welfare, or welfare wedge. So this is the percent point difference. So this is what's the absolute difference in the percent points gains from trade. Notice that the, st the, the largest, the variance of the demand shock, 
the larger is the bias uh, in measuring of welfare. And that bias comes from two dimensions that I mentioned before. It comes from entry and it comes from the size of exporters. So what you plot here is the number of entrants under complete versus incomplete information as a measure of the variance of the demand shock. And so what we find is that, notice that the number of entrants is, this is a ratio, it's less than one. So there is more entry under incomplete information. So in fact, um, given that the demand is very volatile, a lot of firms will try to take a bet on the market and enter. And some of them will be unsuccessful, which results in average exporters being larger under complete information. So under incomplete information, a lot of firms try, but because of the bad realization shocks, the actual sales are very low, and that pushes down the average exporter size. So under complete information, we'll see few entrants that are very large, and under incomplete information, we'll see a lot of entrants that are on average smaller. Okay, and those two margins explain uh, the welfare estimates being lower under incomplete information. So to conclude, uh, what we have done in this paper is we thought about the role of information, again, for measurements of elasticity and welfare. And what we find is that uncertainty, uh, well, th there is a bias, there is information bias in measurements of the trade elasticities. And under uncertainty, trade is more elastic, and as a result, welfare gains from trade are lower. That comes from two margins, the entry margin and the incumbent margin. And what we find is that when we quantify these results in the context of Brazilian data in this paper, is that on average, trade elasticities are 7% larger, and the bias in estimates of welfare gains from trade varies from 1% to 12%, again, depending on the extent of uncertainty. Okay, thank you. Good afternoon. So, thank you, Olga, for a very nice presentation because I was not sure about some parts if I understand them correctly. Mm -hmm. So thanks to you now, I can a bit be a bit more confident in what I'm saying. Okay, so uh, the paper is, I would say, largely theoretical. And the theoretical framework is based on the analysis of export decisions of firms, where firms act under two possible environments. Either they have a complete information environment and they decide on export value. So I like the word value, export value more than export sales, but that's the same uh, given the demand and own productivity. Or they can be acting under uncertainty about the demand uh, on, the, on the firm's product um, in, in export markets, right? So then in this case, the firm uh, this uncertainty is specific to firm and destination. So that's the idiosyncratic uh, demand uncertainty that is being considered. And as a result of this uncertainty, firms decide um, on the export quantity only taking into account on productivity because they don't know the demand. So then the um, extens extensive margin of trade elasticity with respect to variable cost uh, under uncertainty is higher than under complete information for sufficiently high entry thresholds, right? Is that okay? Okay, so then this uh, going from the theoretical framework to the empirical findings, I think they uh, identified three key uh, empirical findings. First is that under demand uncertainty, the extensive margin contribution to the trade elasticity is larger than under complete information environment. So this is this amplification effect that entrants create more trade after shock than under perfect, uh, under shock environment than under perfect competition. Um, and that the stronger the uncertainty, the larger the difference in elasticity estimates with demand uncertainty compared to perfect information. Uh, complete information environment overstates the welfare gains from trade. So these are the, uh, uh, Empirical results that, as I understand, are coming from the fact that we are dealing with sufficiently high entry thresholds as well. Um, so then the assessment and contributions. Uh, first is that this paper is uh, first to study and quantify the role of imperfect information about on demand in determining trade elasticities with respect to variable trade costs. Uh, I like very much that provides this very interesting and policy relevant suggestion about what data we should use uh, when we want to estimate the trade analysis so that under uh, perfect um, 
perfect information we should be using the uh, expert value data and under imperfect information assumptions we should be using um, the quantity data uh, the paper also contributes to welfare analysis of trade gains under different information structures and so it's a, this one I really liked the, how rigorous the theoretical analysis was so this was very um, very very impressive okay so then now let me move to some suggestions or comments so there, there are three major suggestions that I have first is uh, I think I would <coughs> suggest to develop a bit more uh, the understanding of how economically significant the effect is likely to be. Uh, what I mean by this is it would be nice to have some, uh, in, next to the structural estimate, or some reduced form analysis of uh, the elasticity of export quantity and value as a response to, in a response to variable trade cost, just taking some tariff changes or even using some structural gravity estimates and compare the actual numbers with those that are suggested by the structural model that you use. And uh, why I'm saying this is because the example that you have in the paper suggests very small, in fact, contribution of this extensive margin. So in case of when there is a $1 million change, then the even under the, inf uh, the uncertainty set environment, the contribution of extensive margin is $63,000. Or $65,000, which is in $1 million change, is a very, very small. And then for complete information, it's even smaller. So then, while in structural gravity, we actually think that the uh, both intensive and extensive margin responses to variable trade costs actually are very large. So this is something that I thought was difficult for me to reconcile. Uh, second is about, uh, I think that some assumptions are uh, maybe a bit rigid and <coughs> would have to be a bit more also discussed how they reconcile with the data. So for example, um, you, you also showed towards the end this graph where in some of your observations the variance of sales minus variance of quantities is close to zero or even negative. So then this should somehow be maybe discussed if this has implications on model, maybe this could be kind of incorporated. Then I think I have difficulty with this part about the that firms can either decide quantity or prices because when they make the customs declaration they have to report both and what I think is happening in real world is that when they ship something that then because of the demand changes the shock in demand uh, what happens is not that the price clears the market but the market doesn't clear then they have oversupply this oversupply is being stored and then sold in next period and leads to reduced shipping next period. So an example, I had one pay, uh, study about the Ukrainian car industry and then when the car industry was hit with a demand shock in uh, 2008, then what happened is simply that the imports in 2009 were really, really small and the firms were selling at the old prices the cars that were already shipped in 2008. All right, so this is something that I think it's, it's worthy to discuss uh, how it is, uh, would, if this kind of behavior would affect the model predictions. Okay, and finally is the part, I understand how this comes in the model, but I'm just trying to think, is this something I believe that the informational structure affects only extensive margin and not the intensive margin? This is tough for me to uh, just intuitively to grasp, so I think Bringing there some, even maybe anecdotal evidence, would really be helpful. And final part, so it's more like of an empirical person. I think this is where um, uh, to try to think a bit about the external validity, because you have to, for the estimation purposes, you are you have to choose the observations where you have many firms in a given destination year. I understand, but then this requirement itself creates a selection because you need then six digit good where you have 100 Brazilian firms importing in one year to Germany. And that's very, could be very, very special industries. And at the end you have 190, uh, actually it's not six digit goods, I'm wrong, that it could be even less because some could be repeated, no? Uh, 
but even if this would be completely all different, out of 5,300 goods. So then this is something that you could show some, you know, distribution in HS two-digit groups. So where are these sectors? What are these sectors? It would be very interesting. And is this really, do you get some selection issues or not? Um, then finally, once you have to do the welfare analysis, you kick out those where the demand uncertainty variance is negative and where moments are finite and you're even left with fewer. So then the selection issue could become even more uh, serious. So then I would say then if you discuss this sample results and provide some histogram of the sample goods, it would be something very interesting. Uh, I think it's also relevant to the question that Lev had in the beginning about the Coca-Cola because or Barbie dolls, because a sector where you would have 100 firms, these are not Coca-Cola sectors. So these are actually very different firms, very different goods. And then some minor comments, because I just have one minute. So this sufficiently high threshold part. How high is this high threshold? Um, also, this proposition one, if you bring some intuitive intuition in addition for people who are not in theory, this would be also really great. Um, then some questions about the normalization you use for welfare, if this is, has an impact or not. Maybe it doesn't, but it's just something that would be nice to discuss. Um, yeah, and some, again, some presentation about the uh, model choice, which can be very straightforward for people working in this area, but for people not working there, for example, I wasn't sure why you have product of utility for sectors, because in structural gravity, we sum everything across countries and across sectors. And here you sum across countries, product across sectors. So this is maybe all straightforward things, but if you just discuss them, it would be great. So thanks a lot very much.